Hello and welcome to our Bible class. We appreciate you coming in and being with us uh, for this time together and uh, hopefully we'll gain much out of our study of the Word of God. Let me in the first place uh, make the announcement that the elders have decided to resume meeting at the church building for Wednesday night Bible class beginning next Wednesday, February 3rd. So we're glad to be able to do that and uh, be able to uh, come back together again to have Bible classes and hopefully this pandemic will end very soon with the immunizations as, long, as soon as they're all available widely for us. Hopefully all this will be over with uh, sooner rather than later. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we have to come together and study. We pray that you would bless us in our efforts for good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue our study this evening of essentials and expedience. Now, now let me first make sure that I share my screen. And there it goes. Yay. So now let's come in on this. All right. Here we are. Essentials and expedience. Now, let me also make mention of the fact while I'm thinking about it, that uh, this is related to the subject of uh, hermeneutics. I'm getting back out of the share of application because I wanted to make sure that we understand. Hermeneutics is the science or the study of interpretation in a general sense. In the specific sense that we're talking about, it is biblical interpretation. You say hermeneutics, Herman who? Haven't heard of him or his family. Well, hermeneutics is the science of the study of interpretation. And context is vital. Context is vital enable, to enable us to, in, to understand scripture. When you go to the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah and his uh, compatriots read the law in the presence of the returned Israelites, the Bible says they gave the sense, that is, they gave the understanding, they caused the scripture to be understood. They were engaged in hermeneutics, interpretation. Interpretation, as we're talking about, means that we are reading in order to understand properly. When we uh, look at the context of scripture, we look at the genres, the different genres of scripture, which is to say the book of Matthew is far different from the book of Revelation. They're both different genres. One is a gospel. One is apocalyptic. The first verse of Revelation says the apocalypsis in the Greek text, which is apocalypse, is written in apocalyptic language, even though Revelation has elements of letter, Revelation chapters two and three, also prose, where uh, John addresses the church directly. Still, the vast majority of that book is apocalyptic, written in that genre. Then you have letters, which are the vast majority of the New Testament. You also have the history book, Acts, uh, and of course, the Gospels. In the Old Testament, you have a wide variety of genres. You have history, poetry, prophetic, uh, all of the wisdom literature, all of these different genres are part. You have to respect these genres. And the, sometimes the genres within the genres, the styles within the styles. Uh, so we must respect that in interpretation. And we can derive what is figurative as opposed to what is literal. The, the context normally will indicate that clearly. So we've got to be able to uh, uh, make those distinctions and respect those uh, things concerning the scripture. You know, Peter said that Paul, some of Paul's writings were difficult to understand, and I'm glad he said that. An inspired apostle said they're difficult to understand. Uh, that doesn't mean they're impossible to understand. It just means they're difficult. And I have no, I have little doubt that Peter was referring to the book of Romans uh, when he said that about Paul's writings. But we can understand scripture. And this is what we're, we're involved in is a hermeneutics, and it's specifically one aspect of hermeneutics, which, of course, is uh, uh, understanding essentials and expedience. So let me share this once again. Let the screen go off into the distance. There it goes. And now, well, there, there we are. Now we're in. All right, the command that we're dealing with initially tonight 
is baptize them. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, baptize them. Uh, so what's included in the law? Well, first, there's a burial and a raising. Romans 6, 4, buried within by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism. The word itself, baptizo, baptizma, means immerse, dip, plunge, submerge. That is inherent in the word. The late brother Hugo McCord once said that the word baptism, baptize, is a cover-up word used by the translators to obscure the true meaning of the word itself. So it is a burial. It is a raising. It is to be done in water. In Acts 8, 27 to 39, we read about Philip and the eunuch. Philip was commanded to join himself to the chariot. The eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53, and he said to Philip, who does the prophet speak of himself or some other man? Philip began at that same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. Now, what did he preach? I submit to you, he preached the same thing that he preached when he was in Samaria, where he preached Christ unto them. When they believed Philip could preaching the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, they were baptized, both men and women. So he preached the name of Christ, the authority of Christ. He preached the kingdom of God. The earthly manifestation of the kingdom is the church. And then he preached baptism. Well, he preached the same thing to the eunuch that he did to the Samaritans. Because the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Now, where do you suppose he got the idea that he had to be baptized? He didn't know who Jesus was. Philip preached it to him. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. So it is in water. It is for believers. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's the same thing with Acts 8. The eunuch had to believe in Jesus Christ for him to be baptized. You know, uh, so we must have the capacity to believe. The purpose of baptism is for the remission of sins, for salvation. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That word for in the Greek is the word that means unto. Now, some of our religious friends will say, well, that word means because of. You're baptized because of remission of sins. But yet that same phrase for the remission of sins is used by Jesus in Matthew 26, 28. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he gave thanks for the fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That same word is used in, in Matthew 26 that is used in Acts 2. Now, what did Jesus shed his blood because people had already had their sins forgiven? Why no? He shed his blood unto the remission of sins. We are baptized unto the remission of sins. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus himself said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's simple as one plus one equals two. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. If I were to say, he who believes and is baptized shall receive a million dollars, do you think you'd have any trouble understanding that? Now, don't get excited. I don't have a million dollars to give. <laughs> but if we can understand it from that perspective, then surely we could understand it from Christ's perspective. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved for the remission of sins. May I pause right here, too, and say this. How do we know that anything in the Bible applies to any of us? My name's not in Scripture. Your name's not in Scripture. And yet we assume, I think correctly, that scripture applies to us today. The only way we can do that is by inference. There's another aspect of hermeneutics. It is implied. We infer. Now, why is it binding? Not because I have inferred it, but because God clearly implies it. That's very important. Uh, if you ever hear somebody say that necessary inference is not an is not 
good as far as biblical interpretation is concerned, that person doesn't know what they're talking about because it's bound because <clears throat> God clearly implies it. We correctly infer it, but God clearly implies it. Well, moving on. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2.38. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 further says, according to Jesus, we're, we're to baptize individuals in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is, by the Godhead's authority, by Christ's authority. So this passage, Matthew 28, mentions the Godhead. Oh, uh, the one is Pentecostal say that there's only one person in the Godhead. But yet, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 affirm the three persons of the Godhead. This is not the only place in the New Testament where that is affirmed. Uh, but still, we're to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then in Ephesians 4, 5, we're told that there is one baptism. One. Just as there is one Lord, one faith, one God, there is one baptism baptism actually there are many baptisms mentioned in the new testament included among those are the baptism of john the baptism of fire uh the baptism which jesus will be baptized with that he tells his apostles they must be baptized with so there are several baptisms mentioned but by the time paul writes what he does in ephesians 4 there is one baptism one what are some violations of this command, this law to baptize? First, we can refuse. And you know, it's sad to say that there are so many people that simply refuse to be baptized. I'll never forget when I was preaching in Morris, Alabama, Jefferson County, I was preaching on television in connection with the work there. And there was a gentleman that uh, wanted to meet with me who had been watching the program. He was a denominational preacher, a fellow gospel preacher. He had contacted, uh, then contacted me and said, this gentleman wants to meet with you. Uh, do you mind? I said, no. He said, well, just meet me at his house. He told me the address for his house in Warrior, Alabama. So we met at the gentleman's house and he said, you know, he said, I enjoy watching your program, David, but he said, I disagree with you on several points. I said, well, that's, that's fine. Let's talk about it. He said, well, one of those is baptism. He said, I know you believe that baptism, you teach that baptism is essential for salvation. I don't believe that. I said, well, I said, the New Testament, I think, clearly indicates that. He said, I know what you say. I know what you say. Well, let me, let me tell you my experience. He said, you know, I was baptized when I was young, and I uh, eventually began preaching. But he said, you know, I was driving down the road when I got, was in my, I think, so when I was in my 30s. He said, I was driving my car and all of a sudden just this feeling overwhelmed me. God was talking to me. The spirit was talking to me. And, and uh, I know at that moment that I got saved. He said, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I never would be baptized. That floored me. This is the same gentleman that said that when he would preach, quite often the spirit would put on his heart and on his tongue what he was going to say, where he didn't have to even look at his Bible before he entered in the pulpit. Then later on that same conversation, he said one time he got in the pulpit and made a mistake while he was preaching. I said, whoa, wait a minute. You said earlier that the spirit gave you what to preach, and now you're telling me that you made a mistake. Is the Lord responsible for that mistake? He didn't like that much. But, I mean, it's a legitimate question. Well, I sadly did not persuade him that he had to be baptized for the proper reason. But still, there are those that refuse. They simply refuse. Then there are those that would sprinkle and pour and say that that is baptism. No, that's a violation. The word itself, baptizo, baptizma, means to bury, to immerse. John, when he came through a preaching before Jesus, was known as John the Immerser. I know he's normally known as John the Baptist, but what he was doing was he was immersing. John the Immerser. He wasn't sprinkling. He wasn't pouring. The word itself means to immerse, to bury, to submerge. What if we decide we're going to baptize somebody in oil? No, not motor oil. <laughs> Vegetable oil or canola oil or olive oil. No, that's not oil that we baptize someone in. 
It's water. Water, Acts 8. Hebrews writer says your body's washed in pure water. That's baptism. Uh, this, the eunuch, once again, said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? If we're baptized in oil, that's a violation. What about if we baptize babies, infants? Infants cannot believe. They don't have the capacity to believe. When they reach a certain age where they know the difference between right and wrong, then they are accountable. But up until that point, they are safe. They're not saved. They're safe. And it's the same case with those who have been mentally incapacitated from birth, not able to reason. They are in the same situation as an infant. I think about Gene Stallings' son, John Mark. Uh, I firmly believe, and I know bro, Brother Stallings does, and Gene Stallings being a member of the church, John Mark was innocent. That is, he was safe, just like a child in his mind. And so he is not accountable. And it really is uh, a comfort for families to know that infants are safe, that those that fall in that category that I just mentioned are safe, innocent. Uh, they are going to be in paradise when they pass, and they will be in heaven. And this is a very comforting thing. But infants being baptized, that is a violation because babies are not in sin. What if I'm baptized for the wrong purpose? Well, the vast majority of the religious world teaches a different purpose for baptism. Uh, Rubel Shelley once made hay when he said, you can be baptized for a scriptural reason. No, there is one purpose for baptism, and that is salvation. Uh, if I'm baptized thinking that I have been saved already, I need to be rebaptized. I thank God that my grandfather, S.F. Hester, was baptized for the proper reason when he learned the truth. He had been baptized in the Free Will Baptist Church thinking he had been saved. And yet, over years, over a number of years, and uh, study with one of his friends at work and the patience of individuals, uh, he eventually, the seed was planted in his mind and his heart to where when he eventually heard Gus Nichols preach, he was persuaded after he looked up all the passages that Brother Nichols had quoted. He was persuaded that Brother Nichols was preaching the truth and he wanted to be baptized. And he was. If we're baptized for the wrong purpose, we need to be rebaptized, just like those men in the book of Acts that were baptized under John's baptism and Paul baptized them again in the name of Christ. Well, we need to be baptized for the right reason. What if we're baptized by the authority of the church? Not by the authority of the Godhead, but by the authority of the church. No. We are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What if, like the one that's Pentecostal, we're baptized in the name of Jesus only? That Jesus is the only member of the Godhead? No. The Bible's very clear. There are three members of the Godhead. What about trine immersion? Triune immersion, sometimes it's called, wherein the candidate, uh, the person doing the baptizing says a few words and baptizes that person, raises them up, then says a few words, again, immerses that person, raises them up, and then says some more words, baptizes that person, raises them up. No, it's not triune immersion. It's one baptism, one immersion. That's the practice in the New Testament. I read an, a, a chapter in a book written by a member of the church, this chapter particularly, uh, in which that person agreed with triune baptism, triune immersion. No, that's a violation of the, of the command to baptize in the New Testament. What are some expedients, some incidentals involved in the uh, obligation to baptize? Well, first, what if we baptize in a river or in a pool or in a baptistry? Well, it does not matter. The, that's the expedient. The incidental is baptizing in a river, pool, or baptistry. I would add a creek to that. Many of you remember the days where baptisms took place in creeks and in rivers. Well, you know, the place of baptism, uh, where you're baptized, is an incidental. 
And I will forget the first place I ever preached full time, Quintown Church of Christ. Uh, it was in a unique building in that when you entered into the building, by the way, Randall Bailey here on, on our faculty preached there several years before I preached at Quintown. But you would enter into the church building. And when you were inside the church building, and when I was standing behind the pulpit, I was preaching in Walker County. But then when you walked outside of the building into the parking lot, you were then in Jefferson County. <laughs> the building was literally on the Walker Jefferson County line. So I was a Walker County preacher, yet I lived in Jefferson County. So the baptistry itself was inside the church building, you know, it's norm normal for most bill for almost all buildings now. Uh, but one Wednesday night we entered into the church building and it was in the summertime. And we felt some heat coming from somewhere. And that was odd. And the closer we walked up to the where the podium was, the warmer it got. And so we opened up the door on the right-hand side that led into the baptistry. And we saw moisture on the walls inside that little hallway leading into the baptistry. The, ba the heater on the baptistry had gone kaflui. And it was running constantly to the point that when we looked into the baptistry, it was boiling. The water was boiling. I kid you not. And it just so happened that night, there was a young lady who wanted to be baptized at the end of our class service. So what we had to do was go down the street to one of the elders, his house in the backyard. He had a swimming pool. So I baptized this young lady in a swimming pool. Well, nothing wrong with that. You know, that's expedient. There's another incident that where I baptized an individual. This was when I was preaching up in the Shoals area, up in the uh, Muscle Shoals, Tuscumbia area. And there's a gentleman who was in his 60s. And he is at this point was in a wheelchair. He could not, he was not mobile on his own two feet. His son was a faithful member. His son and family were faithful members of the church there where I was preaching. Yet he himself, this uh, uh, older gentleman, uh, was uh, not a member of the church, but he had been attending regularly, had been listening carefully to my sermons and to what was being said in Bible classes, and he decided he wanted to obey the gospel. So uh, we knew it was going to be a little bit, a little bit difficult for his circumstance because of the fact that he was on a wheelchair. But we happened to have one of our members there who was a medical doctor. And he agreed to come and bring his black bag with him just in case something happened while, during the baptism. We also had some men who were EMTs. And uh, they came dressed, uh, you know, appropriately in case something happened. And they even brought a stretcher with them. What they did was they placed, after I took the, the man's confession, they placed him on a stretcher. And then I... Oh, uh, actually went up to the front of the baptistry. If I remember correctly, I was not inside the baptistry. I went up to the front of the baptistry. There were two gentlemen who were EMTs that got into the baptistry. The two men holding the stretcher outside of it. What they did is they raised his stretcher over the front into the baptistry. The two men that were in the baptistry took the stretcher on both ends. And then what I did is I said what I appropriately, what I normally say before a baptism, and then I lowered my hands for them to lower him in and they immersed him on that stretcher and then raised him up out of the water on that stretcher and then raised him over the front back to where those two gentlemen were uh, that were in front of the baptistry. Very unique situation. And of course we had the doctor standing there on ready in case something were to happen. Nothing did. It all went smoothly. This same gentleman, when I took his confession, before they put him on the stretcher for the baptism, uh, I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? He said, yes, sir, I do. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> That's the most unique confession I've ever heard, but it was heartfelt. And uh, he's since passed away, but his uh, son and family still attend that congregation faithfully today. Well, should the water be running or still? That's an incidental does not matter if it's running or if it's still. Story is told about a woman who uh, wanted to be baptized in running water. Has to be running water. 
Well, the preacher got frustrated with her and said, well, what we can do is we can baptize you in the baptistry and just pull the stopper out and let the water run out and we we'll baptize you while the water's running. Well, fact is, it does not matter if it's running or if it's still. We baptize in water. A lake, a pond, a pool, matters not. A tub, uh, I'm sure you've known and have seen people baptized in tubs. A bathtub or a giant tub. It has to be big enough for someone to be immersed. Uh, the person uh, that's doing the baptizing does not necessarily have to be inside the body of water to do the baptism. Oh, um, you know, as long as they're there to assist, that's all that matters to baptize somebody. As long as you're there where you can get to that person to immerse them. That's the main thing. Um, Congregation Lamar County, Mount Pleasant Church of Christ that I mentioned before in connection with the what I presented concerning the Churches of Christ in Lamar County. Mount Pleasant has a unique baptistry. It is inside their Lord's Supper table. Some of you might have seen that before. Uh, the Lord's Supper table doubles as their baptistry. Uh, when they have a baptism, they simply take the cover off <laughs> the top off of the table and inside you've got a big enough place for an immersion to have to take place. And in fact, uh, there is, I think what I understand, they've got uh, it connected to the water system where they can fill it up if you need be and drain it out if need be. So it's not all the time filled with water, but the congregation is so small that the building itself cannot accommodate a full blown baptistry. So this was purchased and it served them very well. Uh, you can, you can, you uh, can, Baptize somebody as long as you have enough water present. What if the water is warm or cold? Well, matters not. Matters not if it's warm or cold. Now, I've baptized people when the water is freezing. <laughs> the heater wasn't, wasn't working. I'm sure you have as well. You may have been baptized in cold water. Uh, it doesn't matter, though. Now, my practice is... When somebody is being baptized, that I, it matters not if, you know, temperature of the water, I do this on every time, that I will take water and put it on the person's back and the back of the neck. Make sure that they're caught, that they are used to the temperature of the water. So when they're put underneath, it won't take the breath, raise them back up. So what if the water is warm or cold is an incidental? What if you sit, stand, or kneel? Again, that's an expedient. The position of the person being baptized does not matter. Now, I know that you've seen probably some situations where there would be a seat built into the baptistry where the back could be uh, lowered down. That is, the seat is uh, somewhat immersed and the person that is being baptized sits on that seat and when they are lowered back on the back of that seat, the whole body is immersed. Well, that's a unique situation. Uh, whether you sit, stand, or kneel, it does not matter. What if you face up or face down? Baptizing face up or baptizing face down? Does not matter. Uh, you know, I can baptize people a lot bigger than me. I know this because I've done it. In fact, when I was preaching in that congregation I mentioned up in the Northwest Alabama area, there was a big old fellow that wanted to be baptized. He's about six, six, 300 pounds. There are people that said, you won't be able to baptize him. I said, just watch me. <laughs> you don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> well, here's the key on baptism. And I'm sure many of you know this already. When you're doing a, bapti a baptism, the key is leverage. You've got to have leverage. If you've got leverage, you can baptize anybody. Now, my practice is when I'm baptizing someone is to get that person to move to my right. I get them to move slightly to my right where they're standing right about at my right shoulder. And then what I do is I anchor my left foot. I plant my left foot firmly on the bottom of that baptistry. Make sure I've got myself anchored well. And then I've got that person on the front with my right hand, the back with my left hand. And then after I say the, the, pro, the words I normally say when I baptize someone, then I lower that person down. That way I'm anchored and I have leverage 
and I can raise that person back up with little or no problem. That was the way I was able to baptize that big old fellow, six, six, 300 pounds, wasn't a problem at all. As long as I've got leverage, as long as you have leverage, you can baptize anybody, no matter what size they are. Um, of course, I can tell some funny stories about some of my uncles who baptize people, but I, I don't, won't take the time doing that. I'm sure you've got some stories you can tell as well about those that you have baptized. So face up, face down matters not. What, and I would also add this. What about the words that are said when you're, bat, when you're doing the baptizing? You know, normally what I do, and I'm sure this is the case with Scott and others who, who baptize normally, the elders and others who, who baptize individuals. What I will say is, I now, based on your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as a son of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, must I say that when I baptize someone? No. It's not an essential. Why do I say that? I say that for the benefit of those in the audience. Especially if there are those in the audience who are not Christians to let them know why we are doing this. And also to reemphasize to the person being baptized why they are doing this. But must I say those words? No. As long as the candidate clearly understands why he or she is being baptized, and as long as that person has confessed their faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that's what matters. So what about if the person is facing the north? Or facing the south. Again, that's an expedient. That is an incidental. Matters not where you face. What about the person doing the admin doing the baptism? The person administering the baptism. Again, that's not essential. Oh, um, there have been those among us who have tried to make hay with the claim that we claim that. Only a preacher in the church of Christ can baptize someone. No, I've never said that. And I've never known a faithful preacher or faithful teacher who has said that either. That is that only a preacher in the church of Christ can baptize someone. No, the person doing the baptizing is an incidental. Oh, as long as the person being baptized understands why he or she is being baptized. That's the key. When I was preaching a small congregation in Walker County, right after college, I had already preached there in the summer of 85. And they asked me to preach again for them after I graduated in 87. This small congregation um, had had a preacher to come in to hold a gospel meeting that first time that I was there in that summer of 85. Then they asked him back in 87 that summer that i was there or that why well, i was there from 87 through late 88 before brendan and i got married and this preacher was popular among the brethren there he and his wife came of course and uh, he did a good job preaching well as it turned out his wife was murdered after that second time he held a gospel meeting, she was murdered. Well, in the process of the police investigating the reason why she had been murdered, it uh, came clear that uh, the husband had ordered the hit on her. Yeah. The husband had hired out men to kill her. And when the evidence began to come out, it just so happened he had been having an affair with a woman in the congregation where he was preaching. And when the authorities closed in on him, he took his own life. When that happened, there were members there at the congregation where I was preaching that questioned the validity of their baptism. Have I, do I need to be rebaptized? I said, no. If you understood why you were being baptized, the person doing the baptizing doesn't matter. Did you understand that you were being baptized for the forgiveness of sins? Well, yes. Did you understand that you're being baptized to place you in the body of Christ, the church, Galatians 3, 26 and 27? Yes. 
Well, then it doesn't matter who baptized you. He has to give an account for his own life. But you were baptized legitimately. You are a Christian. But there were people that were seriously questioning their salvation after all that happened. And that was tragic indeed. But still, the point of this is the person doing the baptism is an expedient. So hopefully all of that has uh, maybe cleared up some matters. And if you have any questions about baptism uh, in connection with that, then you can uh, uh, let me know. Well, let's look at one more before in the time that we have remaining. The whole church come together, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. The congregation, the whole congregation come together. What is included in this? Well, the whole church come together in one place. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 all indicates this. And the first day of the week is when we are obligated to meet. That is when they came together to break bread. That's when the church in Corinth met to take the Lord's Supper. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Well, how often did they come together? They came together on the first day of every week, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And there were extra services that were allowed. We know this because in Acts 2, 42, it tells us that the church at Jerusalem met every day in the temple. So they didn't meet just on the first day of the week. They met every day. Well, how can we violate this command, this obligation? First place, we can refuse. We can simply refuse to come. I don't need to go to church. I just stay home. I just not worship with the saints. You know, in this era of COVID and the pandemic, it is a blessing that we have this avenue of the internet online access to be able to worship with the saints when we cannot be with them and to participate. There have been some of my brethren that have raised Cain over that, but I think that they're just all wet on this because this affords an opportunity for those who cannot leave their homes. I would think of maybe those, those who were shut in, those who were elderly, to be able to participate in worship and uh, worship with the saints. Now you say, well, they're not together in one place. Well, they're, they have come together. And they're in one place in the sense that all of them are together, both in person and online. They are together. The whole church is together. What about sending delegates? You know, in the Civil War, there were those on both sides, the Union and the Confederate, those who were rich, who would pay people to go in and fight their battles for them. And thus was born the phrase, it's rich man's war and poor man's fight. Well, what if we sent delegates to represent us, to worship for us? No, that's a violation. We are to come together with the saints to worship. If we forsake the assembling of ourselves together, Hebrews 10, 25. Forsaking the assembling of our, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. But exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Forsaking the assembling. How can we forsake? Well, when we willfully neglect. When we choose not to worship with the saints. That's when we forsake. What if we say, well, there's only one church per city? You know, the Boston Crossroads movement did that in the mid-1980s, mid to late 1980s. They began to say, well, there's only one church in each city. Well, they've got a problem with the book of Romans. The latter end of the book of Romans mentions several congregations meeting in the same city, Rome. So if you say there's only one church per city, then that's a violation. You can have several congregations in each city. What about instead of meeting on the first day of the week to break bread, we meet on the seventh day of the week to break bread? You know, there are, there's the Seventh-day Adventists that we're familiar with. But there's also Seventh-day Baptists, believe it or not. 
And they would say, well, first day of the week worship, Sunday worship was started by the Roman Catholic Church. No, it wasn't. First day of the week worship was instituted in the, fir in the first century, in the New Testament. And yet we are told that Sabbath day is when we're to meet. No, to look for the Lord's Supper. We are specified in the New Testament that the Lord's Supper is to be taken on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, and we are to give of our means on the first day of the week, not the seventh day. What if somebody says, well, <clears throat> we are not going to have any extra services, no extra services, Sunday night services, no, Wednesday night services, no. I've heard it said, and I know you've had, well, you know, Wednesday night service didn't begin until after World War II. No, it didn't. They're all wet because as we saw in Acts 2.42, they met every day in the temple, every day. It was long before World War II. So if you say we have no extra services, that we can't have any extra services, it's a violation. It's making a law where God has not made a law. Well, what are some expedients, some incidentals? In the first place, all we need is an adequate place. That's all that's really necessary is an adequate place. A place, in other words, that is large enough to accommodate the congregation. It can be in a schoolhouse. It can be in an auditorium, a civic auditorium or a city auditorium. It can be in someone's house. It can be outdoors in a tent. It can be outdoors in a field, or it can be in a church building. Now, church buildings did not exist until long after the first century. The Roman Catholic Church tries to say, well, you know, we have all these buildings and all this iconography that have existed long, way, way back. No, they don't. They can make that claim all day long, but yet it's not right, not correct. Church buildings did not exist until after the apostolic age, long after. So church buildings are expedient. All we need is an adequate place. When I move, when we moved from Tennessee back to Alabama in 2004, uh, the church, the Centerpoint Church of Christ had just sold their building and they were meeting in an old schoolhouse, which was the area of uh, uh, gathering place in that community. And we met there for about a year looking for property, looking for a place to where we could meet permanently. And finally found this place uh, that we bought free and clear, paid for, didn't know any, didn't know anything on it. And the congregation still meets there to this day. Uh, but, in the time being, we were renting that place. It was an adequate place for us to meet. Well, that's all you need is an adequate place, a decent, orderly place, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. It needs to be decent and in order. All things be done decently and in order. Well, it would not be decent and orderly for us to meet in a place that um, is replete with sinful practices. Uh, we need to meet in a decent and orderly place. Do we have authority to buy property, to have a deed, to rent property? Well, yes. That's an expedient. That's an incidental. What about the hour in which we meet on the first day of the week? Well, there's no set hour that we're told to meet. As long as we meet on the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper and to give of our means to worship God, then the hour itself is left to our judgment. What about having a parking lot, restrooms, dressing rooms, a kitchen? All those are expedients. You know, I was when I was preaching in Morris, I had a television program and had a phone call from a lady that attended a, a congregation that we would call anti and she was writing my case about the fact that i had said that we were going to have a meal at the church building every night prior to the gospel meeting she said uh who gave you the authority or where does the scriptures teach that you can have a kitchen in the church building and i said 
uh, right after the script, the verse that says, thou shalt have a bathroom in the church building. She said, oh, that's silly. I said, no, I'm dead serious. You find me the verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt have a kitchen, and I'll find you the verse that says, thou shalt have a restroom. Or I, use, I say, you find me the verse that says, thou shalt have a restroom, and I find you the verse that says, thou shalt have a kitchen. She said, oh, it's a necessity. I said, really? A restroom is a necessity. Find that for me in the New Testament, please. Well, she hung up. Then about 10 minutes later, she called back and started writing my case again. I said, well, I, this is, I'm just telling you the same thing I told you before. You find me the verse of scripture that says, thou shalt have a restroom. And I'll find you the verse that says, thou shalt have a kitchen. She hung up on me again. And then about a week or two later, she called the church building and left a message on the on voicemail that said, we're having a gospel meeting at the such and such church of Christ. And where we're going to be talking about eating in the church building and church cooperations and orphans homes. Bless her heart. She had no clue. The restroom is not a necessity. The restroom is an expedient. Just like the church building is an expedient. It's an incidental in carrying out the command of meeting together and worshiping the Lord. So I hope that uh, this has um, given you some further understanding about these matters. We're going to be continuing this, uh, this class next week at the church building. As we mentioned, we're going to be meeting once again on February 3rd for classes on Wednesday night at the church building in Elmore. And we'll be continuing our study together uh, in some other areas in connection with essentials and expedience. And when we get together as a class, if you have questions about what we've talked about thus far, I will be more than happy to pause right then there and field those questions and we can have a good discussion. Uh, there may be some areas that I haven't thought of that you have some questions about. Is this an essential? Is this an expedient? Uh, where does this fall? Um, things of that nature, I'd be more than happy to address them. Uh, you can be thinking about those, and, and we'll deal with that uh, beginning next week. Remember, again, that we're going to be meeting on, on Sunday as we've, we've resumed Lord's Day worship, both morning and afternoon services. And then beginning next Wednesday, February 3rd, we'll be meeting in person at the building for our Wednesday night Bible class. I'm really glad that you've joined us this evening, and I hope that you will be able to be with us next Lord's Day at the church building in Elmore. Until next time, this is David Hester. May God richly bless you is our prayer.